Hello, and welcome to our session titled Make 2021 the Year to Improve Your Bank's Diversity. My name is Siri Shalazi, and I'm a researcher of gender equality and organizations at Harvard Kennedy School. I'm absolutely thrilled today to be joined by four experts from both academia and financial services to discuss how we individually and collectively can make meaningful progress on diversity in the financial sector this year. I'm going to briefly introduce my colleagues and then we'll dive right into the conversation. First, we have Christina Kempfer, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of Oxford. She researches women's work experiences in finance. In particular, she's interested in how organizational inequalities develop, under which conditions financial elites are reproduced, and what role regulation can play in securing greater representation and participation of women, as well as other marginalized groups in finance. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. Next, we have Darek Wojcik. He's a professor of economic geography and a fellow of St. Peter's College at Oxford University. There he runs a European Research Council funded project on global financial networks, which is focused on the ongoing transformations in the financial sector and their impacts on development. His recent book is on the topic of international financial centers after the global financial crisis and Brexit. He's also the founder and chair of the Global Network on Financial Geography. Welcome, Darek. My pleasure. Next up is Kirsten Oppenländer. She is the COO Central for the International Private Bank at Deutsche Bank based in Frankfurt. She has extensive experience in payments processing, management of operational activities, and the implementation of new operating models. During the last few years, she has acted among other tasks as operations head for the International Retail Bank, as head of digital solutions for commercial clients, and as chief of staff for a member of the management board. Welcome, Kirsten. Thanks a lot, Siri. Looking forward to the discussion. Me too. And last but most definitely not least, we have Chanel Bean. She is VP Product Manager in the payment space within Bank of America's Global Transaction Services, and she's based in New York. Chanel's over 13 years of experience in the financial industry spans various business areas, from philanthropy to HR, with several years focused on new product development and innovation at JP Morgan's private bank. Above all, Chanel has a passion for people, and she's held a variety of leadership positions within organizations, both personally and professionally, with the goal of making meaningful change for the underserved. Welcome, Chanel. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So thank you so much to all four of you. I'm excited to dive right in. And I'd like to start with you, Christina and Darek. You've co-authored a fantastic report published by the Swift Institute titled Securing the Future of the Financial Industry Through Improved Gender Diversity. In this report, you investigate the cultural and institutional framework within which financial firms operate in order to understand the lack of gender diversity in finance. I was incredibly impressed reading this report because you've not only conducted an extensive review of literature and of companies existing diversity practices in order to pull it together, but you also interviewed 52 people in London and Frankfurt, both from top management and HR within banks, but also um, executive search recruiters and diversity specialists outside these firms in order to understand and analyze the landscape. So Christina, if we start with you, what are the top findings and the key insights that jump out at you from your research? Thanks for the summary, Siri. Um, yeah, I think the key insight or the key finding that we observed was that there was actually, despite finance being a global industry, a decisive difference in cultures in the two centers that we studied. So the conversation in Germany on Frankfurt and as well as other uh, financial cities, because obviously um, the, the industry is a lot more dispersed in Germany, uh, centered a lot around gender diversity, whereas other parts of diversity were very much neglected or not that prominent. Um, and in opposition to that, the conversation in London was much more tailored towards socioeconomic background and class, and to some extent, uh, racial diversity, because obviously that's also a big issue if we talk about diversity. I think in general, um, we approach the issue from an intersectional lens, um, kind of emphasizing that within each dimension of diversity, it intersects with other dimensions of inequality. 
but we could still very much observe those nuanced differences between the two centers that we studied. Derek, what would you like to add to that? Uh, thank you, uh, Siri. But first of all, I would also like to uh, join uh, Christina in thanking the Swift Institute again for, uh, for funding this, uh, this exciting research. A couple of things uh, I would add concern uh, uh, variation in terms of uh, gender and uh, general diversity across different parts of finance. So uh, one of the things we find is that banks seem to be ahead of other parts of the industry, such as insurance and uh, asset management. In uh, London's case, it's particularly the US banks, which seem to be ahead in terms of the diversity uh, agenda. And uh, why is that? Uh, we think that this may be related to uh, first the problems that banks have faced in terms of uh, reputation after the global financial crisis. So there's been effort there to, uh, to improve reputation. Also, there's been a lot of new regulation that has affected uh, banks. So as part of this regulatory uh, storm that banks have, uh, have faced, I think they have also embarked on some internal uh, reorganization and part of which many of them uh, uh, embraced uh, at some uh, steps towards more uh, diversity, including gender uh, diversity. And in other sectors which have been less regulated, less reputationally affected uh, by the crisis, maybe in these sectors, people have seen less uh, necessity or need uh, for change and the change uh, has been slow. But with time, there is improvement though. We see improvement uh, across uh, the industry. Also, what we look at the uh, at, uh, in the report is how finance is changing and how this could affect uh, in the future uh, the questions of diversity and gender diversity in particular. So one change is uh, geographical. Of course, we see the rise of uh, Asian financial institutions internationally, but uh, also in Europe, in centers like London in particular, but also uh, in Frankfurt which is good in terms, of, uh, in terms of diversity, in terms of the kind of perspectives and voices being uh, represented uh, in the industry, uh, but not necessarily gender diversity, because when we look at, uh, at some Asian financial institutions and where they come from, for example, in, in China, the level of gender diversity in the financial sector is, is, is quite low. So we cannot really expect this to be a major catalyst of change, at least in terms of gender uh, diversity. And, uh, and then I think most importantly, uh, we've seen a lot of technological change over the last 10 years. So it's not only uh, a decade or over, just over a decade since the crisis, it's also, uh, it's also the time of the FinTech or FinTech fever. We've seen a lot of FinTech development around the world. And this is, uh, this is a mixed blessing because on the one hand we have uh, improved uh, diversity in terms of accessibility of finance, many financial products, for example, accessibility to women. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, FinTech is a technology dominated culture. It's a male dominated culture. Uh, so we have to deal with all kinds of barriers that women face uh, in, uh, in STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, and related. Uh, so there is a real threat that uh, fintech technology may actually uh, set us back in terms of uh, gender diversity in, uh, in particular. Thank you, Christina and Derek, both for that great summary, but also for your excellent work. Let me again recommend the report. It makes for fascinating reading. Kirsten and Chanel, we're very fortunate to be joined um, by you both today to offer the practitioner perspective. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on what we just heard from Christina and Derek. How does it strike you both? Let's start with Kirsten. Well, basically there's, there's uh, quite a lot of things uh, that both of them mentioned that actually relate to um, our day-to-day -day business. I mean, let's start with diversity. I think part of your um, um, thesis was also um, how important diversity is as the company culture. And I can only say I've been working for a firm uh, that um, had, had and has diversity as one of its key values for quite some time. And when I say diversity, I'm not only saying gender diversity. And why do I say that's important? Because basically I think you can't just focus on uh, one part of the diversity um, story. I think either you commit to um, supporting a diverse culture, 
that then sort of, you know, um, openly welcomes everyone, um, or you will always be singling out individuals and not be inclusive. So from that perspective, I think that's very important and it needs to be ingrained in your culture. At the same time, I think what are some of the challenges, uh, Derek, you mentioned the fintech industry, obviously there we have two phenomena. I personally believe it's not only the fintech industry, it's also the startup environment that we uh, carefully monitor. Women founders are less often to be seen uh, than male founders. So in fintech in particular, you have the tech component that Derek, you mentioned already, because stereotype wise and also numbers wise, we don't see as many female uh, tech specialists and we also don't see as many female founders. So what we need to be doing is, and I think that needs to start very early on, is to start fostering at school, at university, and also ensuring that when we hire, we're getting the right junior talent mix in, in order to ensure that we don't lose all the benefits that we've been achieving over the course of the last decade or so. Chanel, how about you? Sure, so I think a lot of the opinions expressed on thus far have been wonderful. And first, I'd like to also thank the Swift um, organization for inviting us to this conversation. I think it's very important and I'm happy to be here. So when I think from um, the perspective of exposure, which was one of the points made earlier, I think it can be done at an institutional level, but it can also be done at an individual level. Um, I know at Bank of America, we have a number of exposure programs, but when I glean on my own personal experience, my introduction into finance was via a internship in philanthropy. Um, at that time, the chair of philanthropy, who happens to be a Black woman, um, not only took me in and offered me guidance and mentorship, but she also took me into her home. Um, and she gave me exposure to the life that she lived, um, exposed me to other leaders that can offer guidance and support as I was transitioning into this new industry. And she really made me feel like, wow, I, it's possible for me, Chanel, to actually excel in this industry, um, which was very influential for me in my career. Um, so I thank her for that. Um, and she, well, another thing that she did was encourage me to not just think about the philanthropic and people side of the business, which is very important and key to me personally, but also understand um, the business side of the industry and, and enter into these rotational analyst programs, which I did. And um, it has afforded me a number of experiences. So I think in addition to being involved in your corporate larger initiatives as it relates to exposure programs, those individual opportunities can really make a huge impact on our future leaders. Um, another great point that was referenced earlier um, was this um, concept of intersecting um, diverse um, perspectives. Um, when I think about the financial industry and leaders, a lot of times the face that you consider is a middle-aged white male. Um, and when I think about myself and putting myself in those shoes and others seeing me in those positions um, as a younger black female, um, it can create its own set of complexities. And a lot of it is subconscious biases because I like to believe that for the most part, people are well-intentioned in their actions. Um, so what does that mean? I think when you walk into a room and you are the only person who looks like yourself and what that may mean to you and how you interpret those feelings. Um, also, when you receive maybe harsh or um, feedback that is tough to swallow, um, it makes you think, okay, am I really not performing? And in some cases that really is the case, or does this person have subconscious biases? Um, so I think it's important as we look to improve our DNI programs, we have to really consider these um, layers of diversity and intersections that can affect um, employees. Um, and then I also, if you have a holistic program, um, one of the things that Barak had mentioned was this um, notion of fintechs and how that space might be kind of counter to the programs. But if you're thinking about diversity holistically, um, it can help prevent some of those challenges that we may see. Thank you, Chanel. I love how you pointed out the fact that unconscious biases are just that, 
unconscious. So even despite our best conscious efforts and intentions, sometimes we unwittingly do and say things that are nonetheless creating an unlevel playing field for those around us and putting certain groups at a disadvantage. And I think it really says something that so many of you have highlighted, this concept of intersectionality and the idea that all of us have multiple identities that are stacking on top of each other and working together to both shape our perceptions of the world, but also to shape our experiences and how other people treat us. And I know, Christina, you highlighted that uh, the report was written and published before this summer's Black Lives Matter movement. And the world has, of course, changed a lot in the last six plus months. How has um, the context, the shifting world around us, changed your thoughts about diversity in the financial services industry? Because there were a lot of other aspects of international uh, intersectionality that you already highlighted in the report. Yeah, I think I would also add to that, that um, being a geographer or doing research from a geographical perspective, there's also the spatial dimension to intersectionality, right? So the regulatory framework, as well as the industry setting, that's also an aspect that kind of contributes to those different aspects or understandings of gender diversity or diversity in general. I think I found really interesting and important how Black Lives Matter kind of put a spot on the aspect of racial diversity, because that is, I can speak in particular for the German sector, but also for the British one, I mean, diversity there is even worse than when it comes to gender diversity. And it's also, it's not being really talked about. I think it kind of comes from the US where it's being problematized a bit more, I would say, or people feel more confident to speak about it. And there's, there's also, again, a different regulatory setting as well as a legal setting that is quite different from the continent or from Europe. Um, but I think it really showed that there's so much more to it than just gender. And that actually, if we don't account for all of these different aspects of it, it will just be a siloed effect that will get lost and it's just tokening from one group, so to say, to the other. And I think what's also really interesting, we should not forget when we talk about finance and gender diversity, and that's something that actually all of our interview partners pointed out, that most financial organizations at the bottom are 50-50. Some of them have even more female employees than male employees, right? So I think there's also this notion that so much needs to change in the industry at the bottom or like in general, whereas I would say, or at least what we could see from our research, the preconditions are actually there, at least when it comes to gender, that's obviously not the case for socioeconomic background or racial diversity. But I think that also maybe makes or should make us think that um, there's the culture aspect, the one that Kristen highlighted. I think that's such an important one um, because we also found that basically you can have amazing programs within your organization, but if the culture is not supportive, none of these programs actually matter. Everyone laughs about them. People don't take them seriously. And then there's obvi obviously this question how to change culture because culture is, I think one of our interview partners said it, it's like, it's like an onion. You can like peel it apart and there's so many layers to it. And I really like that quote. It also illustrates how difficult it is to actually change culture. Um, and we found that probably one of the biggest levers, so to say, is actually senior management. Um, so I think linking these two, culture and senior management, it's really interesting and really important. And it also kind of goes back to intersectionality and in what Chanel has mentioned that I think if you don't see the people at the top that you can kind of aspire to or trust or feel like they hear and see you, um, it's not really going to change or improve. I really like that, Christina, and uh, I think like Chanel said, you were giving the perfect example on your former boss. And I think what's important is that all of us remember those moments. And as we actually get up um, on the ladder, that we actually start doing exactly the same. Because I'm always afraid that, you know, once you have a mentor and then comes that crucial moment where you have to be a mentor for others. Because, uh, Christina, you, you rightly said, in particular in Germany, you would find a lot of banks that have more female staff per se, but you're lacking in parts the role models, and you forget to bring the um, women up the ladder, because for men, that, that works differently. And again, I'm back to good old stereotypes, but we see it a lot that men are just eager to have a career versus women asking themselves whether it's actually worth it, whether they have it in them and whether they can cope. And to bring that across in a way that both sides feel comfortable and that you can bring them up equally, I think is still a huge challenge. Is there something organizations can do to help pave the way to instill the same sense of opportunity and confidence in everyone? Because research consistently finds that there are no 
inherent differences between women and men in traits like confidence or ambition, right? Uh, so there must be something in the water, so to speak, something in the environment. From personal experience, I think it's not looking at who someone is, but what they can do and what their potential is. So for me, a very good example would be to start looking at your entire uh, population, start looking at opportunities that you have within the team, and then looking at what would need to be done in order to bring someone up and why you shouldn't be promoting them. Yeah, we always say there is a job offer and X, Y, and Z would be perfect to take it. Rather than looking at the potential of a person and then saying, okay, what would it take to, um, for Kirsten to make the next step? You could say, well, the potential simply isn't there, which happens. That happens across any, any kind of person. At one point, you're simply maxed out. Nevertheless, maybe it's something you would need a mentor. You would improve on your leadership skills. Maybe the environment in which you're operating isn't the right one. You would need different international exposure those kind of things. And I think for us to ask the question the other way around, uh, to say, you know, what would it take to promote her in that case, really help do the trick because you start looking at people in a different fashion. I would have to say, I absolutely agree with you there. And you kind of speak to the life cycle of management when we think about diversity and inclusion. Um, a lot of times we focus on the whole concept of we need to recruit more diverse talent. Um, even if we're thinking about the various intersections, it's all about the recruitment, but I think it has to be holistic, right? Are we recruiting the right talent? Um, and are we going to the right pockets to get the talent that we're looking for, that strong diverse talent? Then there's also the understanding of onboarding plays a process. Am I giving the talent the right tools? Um, as we're going through development processes, are we having the right conversations? Am I giving them the right level of feedback for them to improve as an individual? Um, as Kristen mentioned, um, when we think about promotion processes, are we thinking about all people and giving them opportunities and thinking about how can I give this person an opportunity to excel? Um, and then also when it comes to recognition, am, am I thinking about pay quality? Um, so it's a full life cycle. It doesn't just start at recruiting. It's not just mentorship. It's all of the levels holistically and ensuring that that continues through your organization. Yes, I wanted to ask then, uh, Chanel and uh, Kirsten, what do you think, it, when we think about HR functions within financial organizations, but also external HR firms hired by banks and other financial companies, are they doing enough to promote uh, diversity and gender diversity? And considering also that often HR functions and HR firms actually uh, do have a lot of women, for example, working and leading these firms. Uh, so we would expect them to be a catalyst of change. Uh, do they uh, measure up to this challenge? I would want to differentiate between HR firms and HR. Within the bank, it's fairly easy to look at HR and the diversity team and say, well, my gender diversity isn't where I would want it. That is not their job. That's my job as a, as a line manager to ensure that I, that I have the right and diverse mix of people in my team. And mind you, diversity there is also how someone actually behaves, interacts, so that it's a really diverse bunch of uh, thinkers, leaders, workers, what have you. For the HR firms, I find that a very interesting view. I think right now there is this huge, um, I wouldn't want to call it war out there, but I think it's a, it's a huge um, championship of identifying those women that you can then actually offer to any kind of company. Because when you start looking at where would you actually find them, uh, look at a lot of the industry conferences. It's actually very rare to see photos like today that there is um, more women uh, than men. Normally you would have like, you know, 90% male representation. Uh, I keep joking and say the, the men are out there at the conference while the women do the work back in the office. Now that is a very unfair view, but that would be one option on where you would find talented females. The other is via networks. And then you come back to when you're being asked, so who would you recommend 
to an HR firm, number one, would you recommend anyone in the first place for several reasons? Number two, if so, you would logically lean towards your own network and then you're back at the fact that we unconsciously or not actually tend to promote not necessarily always the right diversity mix. So on that angle, I also do not envy the HR recruiting firms that now need to actually, you know, cater to their clients' wishes to say, okay, I need at least one strong female in the final round. I would agree with that. Um, I do think that in addition to the role that HR is intended to play, it's a lot about the culture of the firm. I'd venture to say probably quite boldly that at the top, I think most of our leaders at the top have this understanding that diversity is powerful and it's important and it's key to bring into your organization. But I think that where you really get the change and the shift is when you look at the culture of your company. Through my practices, am I really exhibiting this importance to diversity. Um, and I think there are other programs that help. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the Cyborg Star Scholarship Program, which is a phenomenal program for women who are looking to excel their careers. Um, and the fact that my organization has, because they have this diverse view and it wasn't just based off of HR's um, considerations, it was also within our leadership, they identified me as being part of that program. So I think HR plays a role. I think um, ensuring that you have a healthy, diverse culture internally also plays a role, um, having healthy leadership, and then management that kind of also embraces um, the understanding of the importance of HR. So I don't think it's one factor, it's the combination of the factors together. I love that we're talking about culture because I think culture is absolutely critical to all of this. As you've highlighted though, it can also be a very difficult topic because it seems so big and so amorphous that it's almost, you don't even know where to start when it comes to changing culture. Um, and I often tell organizations when I work with them that culture is expressed in everything that you do. And so pretty much starting to change anything on some level will have a reflection on the culture. And one of the key places where we express our culture is in our expectations of success and our criteria for evaluation and what we deem to be good and acceptable and laudable versus not. Christina, we talked earlier about um, exactly this, and you said that there might be some in something inherently about the financial services industry that makes it masculine. Can you tell us more about that? I can try. Uh, I think the question I would also add to a small, small point to what has been discussed just now. I think it's almost impossible to decouple organizational cultures from the wider framework. So what, what we actually encountered when we had those conversations about diversity, um, the understanding in London was a lot more mature and I'm not saying that it's better, but it was more mature and people would almost be offended, offended if we limit ourselves to what has been discussed in Germany and the whole idea of maternity, motherhood, all of these things, some countries and some co corporate cultures are so ingrained within the, I don't know, national context probably within, they, within which they develop that I was really struck. I think we both were really struck when we were reading some of the comments and remarks that we received. So I think that's another really important point that also companies to some extent, how to say, like carry their cultures. Oh, it's really interesting to see whether they take them with them when they go abroad. And I think I would be really keen to hear maybe both Kristen and Chanel's take on that because I found that super fascinating whether company cultures to some extent um, travel or not and, and what role basically the bigger cultural framework plays. Um, coming back to your point about masculine cultures, what I found really interesting is one of the conversations that we had about culture and finance in particular in Germany, the tech or the startup culture, again, kind of nurtured this more masculine understanding of finance. Um, although it's this new, I don't know, agile hip thing that is coming up. Um, and I found that really fascinating. Um, at least in the German context, you could say it kind of goes back to the structure of the of the economy as a whole, that it's a lot more about mid-sized companies, about very German companies, and then there's a lot of male and white people there. Um, so I think that was a really interesting finding in Germany, at least. I think it's a bit different in the UK, and I'd probably also say a bit different in the US, because again, those conversations, 
it's really fascinating to see how the same conversations play out so differently in the same industry. And I would sometimes would have loved to put our interview partners at the same table because they were so almost opposing um, opinions on the same subject matter. Um, so yeah, that's kind of um, my take. But I would be really curious to hear about the whole issue of company cultures and how much they're impacted by, so to say, the home culture. I think that is a really interesting aspect. Also, if we talk about global companies and global industries, I found that very fascinating and I didn't anticipate it when we started uh, the research, Derek maybe did, but I, I was really surprised about that. So I don't mind jumping in there. Um, when we think about um, corporate cultures, um, well, Bank of America is a huge global financial institution. And we actually recently released a human capital report where we really dissected um, the makeup of our leadership team, but also our global staffing. Um, we were pleased to see that um, from a gender perspective, we're actually pretty equal. And that's not just at the junior level, it actually matriculates all the way to our more senior representation. So um, in reading the report, even in preparation for this um, conversation, I was very pleased to see the statistics. Um, they even went as far as to um, one of the things that came up was Black Lives Matter and understand from a racial perspective, even the dynamics within different racial groups, how are we um, populated and, and what does our workforce look like? Um, and we also include um, various layers of diversity in those conversations. So I think that it's important to not just find it important in your organization, but also look at the details and the metrics and, and the supporting factors and, and look, taking a, a deep look in your population to see, does your population reflect what your, what your culture believes in, right? And, and I'm happy to say that ours does, and we seek to continuously improve it and create a pipeline for the future. Um, but it, it, it's a combination of factors. Um, Kristen, I'd be interested to get your perspective too. <laughs> Very interesting thoughts, uh, Chanel. Thanks a lot. Um, basically, I've been thinking about that a lot in particular in preparing today's session. Um, having worked for my entire career for Deutsche Bank, um, having seen how the culture actually um, uh, developed over time and looking at some of the topics that are very fundamental to us today, um, it's actually like looking at a matrix organization, really. We have the corporate culture, take speak up, for instance, which I think is very high up on any bank's agenda these days. If you look at speak up culture per se, we would all say it's, it's very important. We all have to have it. However, when you look at cultural differences in regions and nationalities, you would find that across the globe, uh, different nations actually deal differently with speak up in particular when you look at a politeness factor that you don't disagree with your manager as one example then obviously you need to say it, it doesn't help that you know um, you send a note to a hundred thousand employees telling them that they need to speak up please you need to locally see how you can best ingrain that message and how you can actually ring a bell with the people that you actually want to talk to. When you look at India, for instance, I personally always find it's, um, it's a completely different way to engage staff to also, you know, include them than uh, in Germany, for instance. And I think that's sort of what corporate culture versus local culture does to you, that you have the corporate culture as a frame that should not contradict obviously local culture, but that needs to sort of develop its own power. So the, the do's and don'ts come from the corporate culture, but need to fit the local culture. And you could then find yourself, and I'm sure you've seen that as well, that when you talk to friends, to family, that your value set is slightly more precise in certain areas than it would be to your, to your friends. Uh, which isn't per se a good or a bad it's just i noticed that over time i'm a little more sensitive to certain things that are number one important within the firm and that are important for other cultures that others may not have interaction with so frequently 
So we've been talking about the broader cultural context and national culture. And part of that, of course, is also the regulatory environment and framework. And in fact, Christina and Darek, you write in your report that, quote, the existence of industry initiatives can possibly be attributed to the awareness that achieving more diversity requires a concerted effort that exceeds what individual companies can achieve on their own. I'd love to understand better what you meant by that and if there's some connection between companies individual efforts on diversity and then cross company efforts and the regulations that are in place. Let's start with that. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, we've been talking about the significance of culture, uh, but related to that is the question of regulation because a regulation is an expression of culture, mostly national culture and uh, and it can affect culture uh, itself in the long run, in, in particular. So what we find in our research is that uh, regulation is important and it's both uh, government regulation, uh, top-down regulation, as well as kind of bottom-up regulation, self-regulation uh, in the form of networks and all kinds of industry uh, initiatives uh, where leadership uh, is extremely uh, important. So here, there's a big difference in what we have seen in uh, Germany uh, versus the UK. In, in Germany, uh, they introduced uh, uh, quotas so that uh, I think at least 30% of seats are on non-executive boards in large companies have to be allocated to, uh, to women. And I think this year, uh, there's discussion or uh, introduction uh, starting of uh, quotas for executive boards as well in Germany. In the UK, there's been more self-regulation and bottom-up kind of regulation with industry initiatives and government industry uh, dialogue. Uh, and this goes uh, back a long way. Uh, in the wake of the crisis, there was this women in the city uh, inquiry, which was conducted on behalf of the UK uh, parliament and a lot of other initiatives since then, and a lot of women's networks that have been created both global and often in connection with uh, the American institutions, uh, uh, often spearheaded by, by US banks operating uh, in the city, uh, a lot of uh, national as well as local uh, organizations, as well as EU level organizations, which also operate in Frankfurt. So we see in London organizations like 30% Club, Women in Banking and Finance, City Women's Networks, a lot of interfirm uh, networks, which uh, offer uh, opportunities uh, for uh, women in, in, in particular. Uh, and the government, as I said, launched other inquiries since 2009 into the situation. Also, a part of the regulation which is important is obviously transparency about these issues. So here again in the UK, uh, uh, we've seen an introduction of gender pay gap uh, reporting, uh, which we think is, is important, is an important signal. Uh, transparency on these issues is very important. And it's also, it's transparency is part of the broader question about information on, uh, on diversity in the financial sector, because I think what we lack is uh, high quality uh, measures of gender diversity for not just for individual institutions, but whole uh, financial centers or, or countries, uh, because uh, there is ample abundant evidence that uh, diversity helps uh, financial organizations in terms of their performance. It's not just the right thing to do, it, it also helps uh, performance. Uh, uh, and so it helps the performance of whole uh, financial centers and the financial sector as a whole. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, a lot of indices and organizations that uh, uh, evaluate the performance and competitiveness of financial centers but they don't pay much attention, if any, to, uh, to questions of uh, diversity. So I personally think there's a lot of room for collaboration here between, uh, uh, between researchers and, and the industry, as well as the government, to come up with such uh, comparable measures on diversity, also across financial centers, and integrate them in the measures of financial center uh, competitiveness, so that cities would like to contribute as well by supporting these interfirm uh, networks and uh, initiatives to promote diversity. 
I love this idea of multi-stakeholder collaboration. And here, I just can't resist mentioning the example of the UK and how they've managed to increase the representation of women on corporate boards from about 12.5% in 2011 to more than a third, more than 33% today. So that's a pretty dramatic transformation in less than 10 years in the FTSE 100. And these efforts have now extended to a broader range of companies. And the whole point was that it's not companies doing it by themselves or just the government pushing the companies to do it. But there was a broad coalition of uh, chairman of organizations, certainly the government through the Davies Review and others, but also the 30% Club, um, civil society organizations, academics, the media, the executive search firms that are critical in placing people onto boards. It was a multi-stakeholder effort on the part of all of these people to come together to push for a very specific and measurable goal in increasing women's representation on corporate boards. And I wonder how the rest of you feel about something similar to that in finance, whether that would be feasible and whether you think it would be helpful. If you don't mind me um, adding to that, I think what is really important that, for example, in the case of the UK, um, there's also a legal framework within which these things take place. So there's the Equality Act, right? So the UK talks very differently about equality than, for example, the conversation in Germany. Um, and I think this legal framework, and I think there's the Equalities Commission, like the whole, the issue, despite having a conservative government for quite some time now, is being approached very, very differently. And I think that also factors into it, which is why I think um, it's really difficult. So for example, there's no 30% club in Germany, and you could wonder why is there no 30% club? Um, and the reason, Frank, I mean, it's, it's I, I could guess, I could say there's just not that much awareness for it. People don't like to talk about it. It's, it's People don't like to have a conversation about the subject matter. Like you can really see that people get uncomfortable about it. And we sometimes notice it in the interviews as well. Um, so I think there's this bigger issue about if there's not only the culture, but also the legal framework within which these things take place. And I think um, what we also have to acknowledge um, about the effort that has been made in the UK, um, we've also heard in the interviews that, for example, yes, there has been an increase in women at boards, but it's also mostly non-executive directorships, right? So the question is also which, like what kind of power do they actually hold? So it's really, really important to still have them on those boards. Like I would, I would agree with that because you have role models and you have people in the room who are just more, you don't have this one token woman, but you actually have a group and then people can acknowledge the diversity within this group. But it's also um, whether the power is really changing in the background. I think that's kind of something that we need to add to that. Um, and I think, again, you could probably try to introduce something like this, but as said, which is why I think it's really important to situate the UK case within the legal framework. If you don't have the backing, for example, from the legal background, then it's really difficult to, to go forward with such initiatives. And we've seen it in Germany um, with the discussion about introducing the quota for executive boards. Um, it's really interesting um, what is happening and why do we do this? And why does the industry not itself come together and do something about it? Like that's something that I'm I'm really curious. Um, and I don't know, maybe Kirsten has some answer to the question, for example, where there are well, why there is no 30% club in Germany and no, no similar efforts, so to say. It's it's a difficult question. I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, basically, when looking at this overall topic, I think number one, it doesn't really, in my personal view, make sense to do that for the financial industry. That needs to be an industry goal across all companies in order to also pay into the national culture, if you wish. I think Germany and parts culturally there is still different at a, at a diversity conference probably 15 years back. One comment was, you know, as long as uh, women feel guilty to start working directly after having given birth, nothing will change in Germany. When you compare that for, uh, to France, for instance, where it's the norm and always has been, I think culturally there are still a lot of differences and that culture that sits very close to, I think the German heart needs to eventually be overcome. The other point, um, Christina, there is actually, I mean, you would know this as well, there is those self-declarations of the companies on uh, them giving themselves targets. And I think some, those who are the poster childs right now have given themselves very aggressive targets and most of them have achieved them. However, there is those who've given themselves targets of having no women on the board. 
I mean, not having a woman on the board and setting your target as not having one, obviously, then you can achieve your objective. The only question is going back to the corporate culture, why would you do that? And is that the kind of environment you want to create? I think right now there is a lot of uh, noise in the German public um, on uh, exactly those kind of uh, positions. And uh, personally, I believe also when you start looking at your underlying business, at least those companies doing international business dealing with diverse clients will notice that that kind of practice will be challenged a lot also from their clients. What we find more and more um, in Deutsche and half for the last decade or so, our clients want diverse teams. When you have, uh, when you have a pitch team, uh, when you're in, an, in a negotiation, you want to have a diverse mix of people that you are actually dealing with. And I think that kind of combination, hopefully also for Germany, will eventually start giving the push without, again, the lawmakers having to step in, in order to address this fundamental topic. Chanel, what does this look like in the US? Um, so I think in the US, it, it's similar, but then also different. Um, and I mean that to say, um, we have become very aware of the importance of diversity. I think we see this um, across various types of institutions and, and in finance in particular. Um, government is important to make changes, but I think that really when you think about the government, it can help drive the framework of what you need to consider changes in your organization. Um, but you, what you don't want to create is this um, idea or this notion of, okay, we need to have 50% women, so we're just going to hire 50% um, women and not necessarily, I think the point was made earlier, give them the power to actually lead. Um, motive and intention is going to be really critical to the success of these types of programs. If the motives and the intentions of the leadership is not um, really focused on the idea that we are limiting ourselves because we're not bringing in this diverse perspective and diverse can be not just by the faces of people but the, the way people think like diversity of thought um, if we're not bringing in a diverse perspective we are limiting ourselves to the potential of our organization i think if you are strictly working off the framework of what does the law require or what are our company's initiatives and goals because a lot of companies in the US do have criteria, initiatives, and goals that may not be legally driven. Um, if the focus is just making the numbers, you really won't make the change. But if the focus is understanding that you have this pocket of talent that can make a difference to the organization and you're not tapping fully into it, um, then that's where I think you see the meaningful change. This has been a really substantive and inspiring conversation. I want to thank you all for your fantastic insights. I'd like to finish on a note of action and ask each of you what you hope that people tuning into our session today are going to do in their own organizations in this new year 2021 to advance diversity in the financial sector. Chanel, let's go right back to you. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, kind of going back to the comments made earlier about the life cycle of change again, I think that when you think of the views from the top, most organizations do understand um, at this point that understanding diversity and, and, and inclusion in all your practices is important. But I think ensuring that managers are equipped with um, the tools that they need to ensure that each step of the process considers um, diversity and considers inclusion across the intersection of groups is what's going to be key to, to making a difference. And if your organization does not have the tools that you feel are um, adequate, it, you may have to take time to really educate yourself on some practices, tools, and ideas um, that might further you and the people on your, on your team. Thank you, Chanel. I love that focus on empowering managers who are actually at the front lines making these decisions day in and day out that influence who gets hired, who gets promoted, who gets the biggest bonus, right? Who gets to do that high profile project, that those managers on the front lines are educated and empowered with the right tools to advance diversity on a daily basis. Thank you so much for that. Kirsten, let's go to you next. 
I think this um, this is actually the um, the basis uh, that's required for my wish. I would wish for all of us, for any people decision, to take a step back and carefully review what it is we're doing. What do I mean with that? It's always easy to say when it comes to promotion, when it comes to hiring, to say, ah, oh, we need to ensure we uh, have the diversity ratio right, etc. Nevertheless, and Chanel has mentioned that before, there is so many opportunities during um, a year, be it um, looking at who gets what learning opportunity, when it comes to assignment to training courses, when it comes to assignments of projects. Yeah, if you have a special task, look out and see who the people in your organization are that you maybe don't know so well where you would want to test how big their potential is and just give one of those special tasks to them and test them. And with that, I'm absolutely convinced we can overcome that bias and we can eventually bring up a much more diverse talent pool throughout the ranks of any organization. Thank you, Kirsten. Very sage advice. Derek, let's go to you next. So I would like, in general, I would like everyone to see uh, diversity in finance, but also beyond, not just as a matter of, uh, of social justice, but a matter of uh, competitiveness. A diverse financial institution can uh, be better at attracting talent, uh, using this talent to be innovative. Uh, ultimately, as Kirsten said, uh, better for clients, especially the kind of clients that whose expectations are changing with millennials and, and younger generations uh, as well. And more specifically, uh, we live in the age of data. So I see a lot of potential to leverage data to improve transparency on diversity across organizations, but also across financial centers, and to really have a kind of collaboration that helps to uh, develop uh, measures of uh, uh, diversity as part of measuring uh, competitiveness of uh, financial centers and financial systems. Thank you, Derek. I couldn't agree with you more. I think if we started seeing diversity and inclusion as the same kind of business imperative that is regulatory compliance or uh, superior performance and profits in the marketplace, then I think we could make progress much faster because those are things that we just have to get done. Um, and in the 21st century, diversity really is becoming one of those things. We simply have to get it done for a competitive advantage. So thank you for those thoughts. And finally, Christina. Yeah, um, thank you so much for this. I have to admit that actually Black Lives Matter and everything that I kind of am still learning from it really made me rethink what I would advise to companies. And I think as much in the case of racial diversity, it's not the responsibility, for example, of people of color to point out what is going on and to make changes. In this case, I think shift away the burden from women to do the work and actually within the companies. Um, one of the interview partners that we interview said it, and I don't know whether I'm quoting them properly, but that it's actually the majority of men that need to, need to change and not necessarily women or other minorities. And I think that's something that I would just echo not only because now that you have a lot of grievances actually from male employees who feel that they're being unfairly treated, um, which is another conversation that we could probably have for hours, but rather um, make it the responsibility, not of those groups who are facing discrimination to change something, but those who are in the position of power and advantage. Um, and in finance that mostly is uh, white men. So I would say um, the change needs to happen there. That's a really powerful note to end on. Thank you, Christina. A call to action for each of us individually and also collectively in all of our firms. Thank you uh, so much to all of you panelists for your fabulous commentary and for all the work that you are doing to advance diversity in the financial services sector. Now it's over to you. Let's make it a good new year 2021. Thank you so much for joining us today.